Hi everybody, this is David Paul. Thank you for joining us today. We've got an interesting topic on flow reversal RO. So we'll have a 45 minute presentation. I'm just gonna give a 10 minute intro and then Ronit will give 35 minutes on the details of this technology and then we'll allow 15 minutes for question and answers. So during the presentation, please type your questions into the question box and then we'll get to all the questions at the end. You'll receive an email right after this webinar with three survey questions to find out you know, what you thought of the webinar. It'll only take 10 to 30 seconds, so please fill it out. This presentation is recorded and it'll be available on our website next week. You'll also be sent a thank you email with a PDF of this presentation in the next day or two. So just for your information, AdEdge and DHP Inc. do not have any financial relationships, so no money changes hands here. This webinar is simply prevented be presented because we feel that it's a topic that's of interest to our clients. I've been working in water treatment for a long time, uh, reverse osmosis water treatment since 1977. Uh, Ronit, has over 20 years of experience in biochemistry research and business develop and involved in the successful commercialization of several water treatment technologies. And she has a doctorate um, from Israel as well as other degrees. So we appreciate Ronit being with us today. So I'm just going to give a very brief overview of the points in traditional RO which almost everybody has, um, that this flow reversal addresses. So as you're probably aware, RO units can come from very small to very large sizes. They can be one stage or more than one stage. If there's one stage, then pretreated feed water enters a parallel set of pressure vessels. Permeate is produced from each pressure vessel. What doesn't go through the membrane exit as concentrate, brine, or reject. All three of those describe the same term. Seawater units are almost always one stage. Uh, brackish water units are usually two stage. So the permeate that's produced from the first stage goes to wherever it's going. What doesn't go through the membrane then feeds a smaller number of pressure vessels called the second stage. Permeate comes off of the second stage and concentrate then typically goes to drain. Occasionally, there are also three-stage RO units. In an RO unit, we have, let's say we got a two-stage RO unit here, four pressure vessels on top from the first stage, feed water enters, goes through each one of those membrane elements, permeate is produced, the concentrate then goes to the second stage pressure vessels, and permeate is produced again, and what doesn't go through the membrane, then exits usually going to drain. The membrane elements themselves for most industrial applications are fiberglass wrapped. And we see a picture here of a fiberglass wrapped membrane element. All of the uh, membrane elements, RO membrane elements look essentially the same, no matter what the uh, manufacturer is. On the feed end of each one of these fiberglass wrapped membrane elements, there's a brine seal, and this brine seal doesn't allow feed water to go on the outside of the membrane element. So we see here membrane elements uh, going into pressure vessels, and we see the brine seal on the feed water end of that one on the bottom. So again, brine seal will prevent the feed water from going on the outside of the membrane elements, so feed water enters, the brine seal forces the feed water to go through the membrane element and then exit. So two problems that we're gonna talk about, uh, fouling and scaling. Fouling is plugging of the membrane or feed channels by particles or sticky polymeric precipitates. Here we're seeing a picture of large particulate fouling on the front end. So again, Ronit's going to talk about how this technology would handle this type of issue. Um, also, the fouling rate is going to be the highest where you have the highest water flux, which means the higher permeate, the highest permeate production. Well, here we see that right at the very front, there's more permeate produced than there is in the rear. 
of each pressure vessel. So your highest fouling rate is going to be in the first inch or centimeter of the first membrane element in a traditional RO unit. Scaling is where the feed water becomes concentrated to the point that some scaling compound exceeds 100% saturation. So we see that on the feed water side of the membrane, every inch or centimeter of the way, the feed water TDS, total dissolved solids, goes up and up and up. So the most concentrated water is right in the last inch or centimeter of an RO unit. So that's where the highest scaling potential is. The last thing is chemical cleaning. Because of the brine seals, most membrane manufacturers and chemical vendors are going to say you need to clean in the same direction of flow as normal service. That way you know that your cleaning solution is going through your membrane elements and a portion of it is not going around your membrane elements. And then, But clearly, when we see a, a picture where the very front of a membrane element has a lot of particulate material, there is no way on earth that it, if you clean in the normal direction of flow that that material is going to come off. Okay, so that is just our brief introduction on traditional RO units so that we can understand how this flow reversal uh, re uh, reversal technology um, can benefit to those issues that I've just described. So now I'm gonna turn this over to Ronit who will do the remainder of the presentation. Hi everyone. Okay, so uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure and great opportunity to share with you some fascinating information about uh, innovative approach to, uh, you could say, uh, reverse osmosis, but actually it's uh, for a bigger problem that we all have as water professional and uh, with the water scarcity, which is how do we handle inland desalination in an environmentally responsible manner and how we manage the concentrate. So we're going to talk about an optimization process for a conventional RO by integration of flow reversal technology. Okay, so just a few tiny words about Adage. Adage uh, is the company I work for, and we started as an arsenic uh, uh, company for removal of arsenic. Uh, until today, we have more than 900 systems installed in uh, 15 countries. And uh, one item that I like to share when introducing Adage is the treatment matrix that you see here on the right, and it lists all the contaminants that we can treat and all the technological approaches that we use in order to remove multiple uh, contaminants and any combination of them. So I would like to start with uh, uh, sharing with you the buzzwords in the water industry today. So we hear about potable reuse and ROI and cost effectiveness and concentrate management, regulation, decentralized systems, circular water economy, water ratio, high recovery, low waste, ZLD, MLD, sustainability. All of these are issues that the water professionals today want and need to address. So how can we address these challenges? Only one of the ways, it's something that we do. And the claim that we like to make today is that 70% recovery rate is totally belonging to the 70s. And why do I say it? When you look at this chart, you see a list of actual sites with reverse osmosis uh, plants. All of them could end their life as conventional RO, but we decided to implement flow reversal RO for these plants. So what you can see in the orange column that by implementing flow reversal RO, we could increase the recovery rate by 20%, 27, 8%, it uh, 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 changes due to the uh, feed water quality, of course. But the point it is that we can do better fairly uh, easily. So we're going to talk about high recovery flow reversal RO, which I like to say that it's a conventional RO with a patented twist. It's important to say that it's innovative, but it's not new. Here is a list or logos of uh, customers that already use these technologies. And at the bottom, you can see that last year, twice, 
we won first place as the most valuable technology for desalinations in Singapore and in Texas Desal Conference. We're very proud of it. So what can flow reversal do? We can increase the permanent flow, the recovery rate by 20%. And accordingly, if we wish to do so, we can reduce the feed water by 20%. And we can also decrease the concentrate flow by 60% and even more. The bottom line is that we're addressing the concentrate management concern and getting a bit closer to being able to make ZLD, zero liquid discharge, cost effective. I know that it sounds weird to many of uh, the people in this uh, on this webinar today, but our actual uh, analysis now that shows that by in reducing the increasing the recovery rate, ZLD is uh, economically feasible. Okay, so how can we save if we increase recovery rate? At the top and inside the frame, you see a scenario of conventional RO with 80% recovery rate. Feed is uh, 100 and 500 gallon per minute. Permit is 1200 gallon per minute. 80% recovery rate. Now let's implement flow reversal RO. Please look at the bottom of this slide. And we increase recovery rate to 92%. In this case, we can decide as end users that we want to keep the const a constant permit flow which means that we need permit of 1,200 gallon per minute. Someone else may decide that they want to keep the feed flow of 1,500 gallon per minute. Please look on the right at the bottom of the slide. So we have a constant feed. The bottom line is that in both scenarios, we're reducing the concentrate very significantly by 60% or more. Okay, so what flow reversal basically is doing is preventing scaling. We know, and just like David mentioned, mineral scaling leads to plugging, biofouling, uh, decreasing the flux, and so on. I love to show this picture on the left of the uh, electron microscope, the image of the crystals of scale. It, it's really gorgeous. But when you look at the bottom, at real life, how scale is looking, it's a pretty um, ugly, I would say. So when we operate with flow reversal, we increase high recovery by reducing the scaling potential. So how do we do it? Um, let me, I skipped one slide. Let me explain why it's so a uh, brilliant and uh, effective approach. First of all, uh, it's a continuous process. I'm talking about the flow reversal. It works just like conventional RO. Another feature is the fact that you can implement it for new RO systems or existing systems by retrofit, which is a big differentiator for this technology. We do not need to use any proprietary uh, equipment because we always adhere to the manufacturer specs. There is no need for a training, special training for the operator. And we know how hard it is for operators to uh, uh, adjust to in, uh, new technologies. There is no risk or low risk because we have 100% fallback. This means that at any point of time, if we do not want for some reason high recovery, we can go back and operate the exact same flow reversal machine as conventional RO system. And what we learned from experience in the field is that the process reduces biofouling and chemical use. So how do we convert a conventional RO to flow reversal? It's quite simple. You see here a system, a, floor, a conventional RO system uh, with two stages. Blue is stage one and red is stage two. And I'm going to make the point that by a click of a button, which I died, just did, I can convert this system to a flow reversal RO. We add some valves, some piping, and we can operate it as flow reversal RO. So how does flow reversal work? There are three principles that we need to remember. One is reversing the flow in the pressure vessel. Two is block rotation. And three is the fact that it's a continuous uh, process. The result is scale prevention. Let's look at reversal of the flow in a pressure vessel. This is a conventional pressure vessel and feed water flow from right to left, from the green part to the blue part. 
Then we, prior to the induction time, which is when we start seeing signs of scaling, we reverse the flow in the exact same conventional pressure vessel. Now the feed water flow from left to right, from the green to the blue again. But the area that is circled uh, gets, uh, 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 it's being rinsed by undersaturated solution, which removes the scale if it ever formed. Let's look at block rotation. What happens here? Again, this is the system that I showed you before, two stages, stage one blue, stage two is red. Please notice the animation and the direction of the flow in each block. You see that we divided it to, two, to three blocks, block A, block, block B, and block C. Now, prior to the induction time, look what happens. We rotated between block C and block B. Now, stage two in red is block B, and stage one is block C. And at the same time, if you compare between the two images, you can see that we also reverse the flow. And so on, prior to the induction time, we rotate between the blocks again. Now, block A is stage two. Okay, I mentioned before, and David mentioned too, that uh, we can reduce uh, fouling of the membrane, in this case, biofouling which is very important for reuse applications when we use treated uh, wastewater effluent. So the reason that we think that, th that this is happening is because when we reverse the flow, we create uh, shearing forces that probably interfere with the buildup of the biofilm. And in addition, we change the water quality. The osmotic pressure is changing and interferes with the proliferation of the bacteria. What are the solutions that we can bring? First of all, we can build new RO systems. We can also retrofit existing RO system and make them a flow reversal system. And sometimes, and it all depends on the cost effectiveness of the solution for each site and it's different, we can uh, build a concentrate management system which is a concentrator of the uh, brine of the concentrate that is in a flow reversal mode. Today, I'm going to share with you three different case studies. Uh, one of them is was PUB. PUB is Singapore's National Water Agency. And the reason that I like to uh, share this case study uh, is because PUB is the most appreciated water utility in the world. It's considered an innovation hub for water technology. And this specific retrofit is fairly large scale, about uh, 3 MGD. And it provided us with a perfect setting for comparison study between a retrofitted train, RO train, and conventional RO train. Both are fed with the same water quality. It represents a, municip a municipal reuse application for industrial use. And we were able to show that we increased revenue and saving for the water utility. The bottom line is that based on the successful result of this retrofit in Singapore, they are now working on a completely new 25 MGD uh, RO system based on flow reversal technology. This is a scheme of the uh, RO plant. You see it's a very big uh, a reverse osmosis plant. And whatever is uh, inside the red uh, square is the three are the three trains that were selected for the retrofit project. And originally, we're talking about two-stage RO system. The pictures all, uh, at the top show the pre-retrofit system with 49 to 24 array. And on the lower right, you see the retrofitted system. I'm sure that you can see the differences, uh, including these uh, valves at the top of each column. There is a 3D rendering of the retrofit at the bottom, and whatever is in yellow are the parts that were added or modified in order to retrofit it to a flow reversal system. The original system had two stages with 75% reco recovery rate. Green represent stage one and yellow stage two. What we did, we converted it into a three-stage system with 91% recovery rate as for today and a different configuration. We added a set of columns 
here and we decided to des designate two columns from first stage, the green, to become third stage. So whatever you see in red function as red as a third stage and in green is the first stage. In yellow is the second stage that operates just as it operated when it used to be just a conventional row system. Let's look at a block rotation. You see here three stages. Two columns in red are third stage and green represent the first stage. Prior to the induction time, we rotate between two sets of two columns. And again, and again. And please remember that whenever we rotate between stage one in green and stage two in red, we also reverse the flow in these columns. And the last one. This table summarizes the result of this retrofit. We started with recovery rate of 75% and we reached 90, actually 91% today. We decreased the concentrate flow from 489 gallon per minute to 192 gallon per minute, about 60%. At the bottom of this table, you can see in blue, I highlighted it because there is a recurring question about the specific energy, about the energy that we invest in order to achieve this high recovery. And what we are showing again and again, that the specific energy hardly changes. As you can see here, we use uh, 1.21 kilowatt per 100 gallon of product, 100,000 gallon of product, and 1.25 with the floor reversal rule. Now I would like to show you uh, a case study of a food and beverage company. And this is an example of an industrial site. So what we're proposing to this plant, it's an arrow plant, is to increase recovery rate from 75% to 95 or to 96% with flow reversal technology. What happens is that by increasing the um, recovery rate to 95%, we increase it by 20 to 95% recovery rate, there is an increase of 27%, which results in really quite amazing reduction in the concentrate flow of 80%. This is very significant because the cost of the water for this plant is very high. Let's look at the financial impact. The purchase and discharge cost of water is $7.5 per 1,000 gallon. So what we see here that with increasing the recovery rate to 95% or 96%, we can save an amount of $250,000 or more per year for this plant. This is a lot of money. The third example that I wanted to share with you is of a municipal uh, drinking water retrofit. Uh, this is a plant that has uh, recurring issues with the uh, RO plant, uh, and they end up replacing the membranes in the third stage uh, once a year, which is very costly for them. And in addition, they have a very high discharge cost of the concentrate. So the current design is a feed flow of 940, one 941 gallon per minute and permat flow of 772 uh, gallon per minute so recovery rate is something around 82 uh, percent with concentrate flow of 169 gallon per minute this is how the system is looking now the current design and here is an illustration that we made just to show you the different stages, the current different stages, green stage one, two stage, a uh, red stage two, and purple is stage three. And here is what we're proposing to do. This is just a diagram of the same system. If you remember, the green represents stage one, red stage two, and purple stage three. What we're proposing is to use stage one and stage two pressure vessels as 
five blocks that will rotate. So stage one will rotate with stage three. This is a PNID of the system. And as you can see, we added a booster pump and a few valves and piping. Now let's look at the block rotation here. Please pay attention to the color of the arrow, the location of the arrow and direction of the arrow. So it's a lot to focus on. Stage two in blue stays the same. However, prior to the induction time, we rotate between blocks. So block a block that used to function as stage three now functions as stage two, a stage uh, one. And also the flow is reversed in the pressure vessels and so on. Let's look at the results of such retrofit. If you recall, we still have 941 gallon per minute feed flow. But look what happened to the permit flow. We increased it by 7.5%. Recovery rate increased to 89%. And the concentrate flow decreased by almost 39%. If you look at the top of this slide, I put some numbers there just to represent the impact of such a retrofit. We saved on the cost of the discharge of the concentrate. The difference is about 93,600 gallon per day. If they pay $2.5 per 1,000 gallons, it's $234 per day of savings, which translate into $93,000 per year. In this specific case, in addition to this cost, the cost increases by 9% every year. So if you look at this as a system that is going to operate over 20 years, the saving becomes very significant for this community. Last, I would like to talk about the application that we can use flow reversal for. Basically, it's any RO or nanofiltration system, new system or existing one whether it's water reuse or brackish groundwater, softening, any primary uh, contaminant. For example, now we are working on a site that has arsenic and fluoride in the water. These are, uh, fluoride is a complicated contaminant to remove and conventional approaches like activated alumina is pretty complex and generate a lot of wastewater and hazardous wastewater. So the best solution for them is RO, but it becomes even better when you use high recovery RO because this is an inland community. It's perfect for industrial applications and definitely helps with concentrate management. An interesting uh, use of this flow reversal technology is for seawater second pass. As you know, seawater, uh, when, when we design a, a desalination plant for seawater desalination, there isn't too much concern about the discharge of the concentrate or the recovery rate because you just send it back to the ocean or to the sea, depending on the source of the water. However, and mainly when you use the water for irrigation, for agricultural applications, uh, there is boron in the water and boron is harmful for many crops. So we show that if we use flow reversal as second pass for seawater desalination, we can get recovery rate of almost 99% and completely remove the boron. So, flow reversal, reverse osmosis is a simple process, low risk, and it's already happening. And as we like to uh, say, we want you all to join the revolution. This is something that was coined by our Marketing Director Richard Cavanera. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ronit. It was a very good presentation. So we're now going to move into the Q&A session. And uh, Ronit has provided lots of time which is great. So yeah. we'll, be able to, we'll be able to answer any questions that you have. So if you haven't written any questions yet, then please write them. But um, Ronit will now take over with a question and 
answers and she'll read the question that you have sent her one by one and then she'll give the answers. Ronit. Okay, there is a question here. Um, uh, what are the color codes in the added slide three on contaminants that can be removed? Yeah, this is uh, our treatment matrix and we color coded the table uh, based on the uh, treatment approach that we use. So, for example, if we uh, look at, uh, let's take ammonia, the first one, it's by alphabetic uh, order. So, what we see here that we can treat ammonia with, it's really hard to see here uh, because it's a small um, image, but we can treat ammonia with a biological approach. The green represent biological treatment. This treatment approach is called pneumonia, pneumonia and it can remove ammonia, iron, manganese, and arsenic uh, at the same time using biological approach. Ammonia can also be removed by ion exchange approach, which is uh, a little bit more complicated, and by reverse osmosis. Uh, if we look, for example, let's take um, arsenic. Arsenic can also be removed by biological uh, approach, as shown in green or by adsorption is shown in the orange color and so on. So this, this is the explanation behind the color code. And I'll be happy to share it uh, with whoever wants to see the treatment matrix. It's also available on our website. Um, how do you reverse the water flow and not roll the brine seal? Or do you just totally remove the brine seal and or use full feed screen wrap membranes? So uh, this is a very good question. Uh, the brine seal uh, indeed uh, is aimed at preventing the water from flowing on the outside part of the vessel. And what happens, this area, the annulus, with time is actually uh, sees water and usually develops even some biofouling and scale. So uh, in the real world, I know that uh, uh, some water professionals intentionally uh, flush the pressure vessels against the direction of the brine seal just to flush the annulus around it. But uh, what we see with the floor vessel that uh, uh, we end up designing it in, in a way that the last stage, the brine seal is always located upstream. Yet we always see the results in the, from the aspect of the permeate flow and the quality of the water exactly as we design it because we were able, because apparently the reversal of the flow doesn't affect any uh, leakage of water that is not through the membranes. So the, to answer that, the brine seal stays in place as in a conventional RO system, and we get the exact results that we expect to see. The membrane manufacturers typically require minimum concentrate flow, and their software alarms when design concentrate flow are too low. What do membrane manufacturers say about this low concentrate flow? Uh, so we designed the system uh, so we keep the, the, the hydraulics uh, just according to the uh, manufacturer's uh, instructions and specs. And so far we use membranes from all known manufacturers and we don't see any problems with this. Next question. What is the impact on use of anti scalant etc., versus standard RO? We use anti scalant whenever it's needed, just like in conventional RO. Uh, because, of, uh, because of the flow reversal, many times we see that we can use, uh, we use different anti scalant but still whatever is commercially available, and we need to use uh, less 
compared to conventional aerobe. But we use the same, and sometimes, you know, we need to add camp feed and anti scaland to control the quality of the water, but it's uh, very similar assumptions that we made when we design uh, conventional aerobe. What happens to the material flushed from the face of the lead element after flow reversal? Uh, I have to inquire about this because I'm not sure uh, that this is an issue. I, I'll have to get back to the person who asked this question. But I, I suppose that just if we do pre-treatment and pre-filtration, we'll handle this issue. I just, uh, I never heard a specific concern about it. Okay, next question. Does floor vessel or require a certain membrane manufacturer or can any membrane be used? Any membrane can uh, be used. Uh, we're agnostic to any type of equipment uh, for the RO. Um, and it's true for every element of the RO system. That's one of the points of the technology, that it's truly like conventional RO equipment. In the food and beverage plant, how often was the plant having to CAP before and after the changes that were made with floor versus RO? What we see from experience that we gathered so far, that we can reduce the CIP frequency, uh, for example, in the PUB, it's not a food and beverage uh, example, but actually it's the water quality is a little bit uh, more difficult. And we reduced uh, CIP significantly um, compared to the conventional row, but it's not something that we can predict. Once we start uh, implementing the flow reversal, uh, we can tell uh, how often we need to do the CAP, but it's definitely um, less frequent. Uh, just a little comment about the CAP, um, and, it, and we did it in the PUB example, uh, since we already have a system of uh, pipes and valves, we can, uh, in a very interesting manner, conduct CAP to part of the uh, RO system while the rest of the arrow is still working. So we take advantage of the uh, additional valves and pipes that we installed. But bottom line, it's less CAP frequency and uh, we need to uh, learn it as we're working with the system in the field. How many installations do you currently have? We have about 25 installations worldwide with uh, food and beverage companies and with municipalities, uh, we show that we can uh, increase recovery rate compared to conventional RO for systems that have very high TDS, is uh, 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 8,000 uh, ppm TDS and more, uh, and reach recovery rate of 95, 98% with um, uh, food and beverage companies. What pressures do you have to operate the flow reversal compared to normal operation? And do you have to flip the brine lip seals of the membranes during the flow reversal? So we definitely increase the pressure. I do not have this slide with me, but I will be very happy to share it. Uh, actual slides that show the uh, pressure uh, during the operation of a flow reversal system. Uh, it's very stable and uh, it's higher of course you need to increase the flux uh, and no we do not flip the brine lip seals of the membrane during the floor reversal the concern with the brine seal is very well understood i mean it's a very legitimate question but what we see uh, that is happening is that we get the exact amount of water quality that we expect uh, from the floor reversal, so there isn't any leakage issue uh, of water that is not uh, treated. Okay, during chemical cleaning for conventional RO, we clean one stage at a time. How do you clean floor reversal RO? 
you clean it just like you clean conventional RO system. The, the mindset, but uh, a lower frequency of CIPs. It's, it's, it really is like um, a conventional RO from this sense, just saving on chemicals. Is piloting required for this technology? No, piloting is not required for this technology because we know that it works and we provide performance guarantee. However, naturally, since it's new to the US market, uh, we are willing and happy to pilot uh, whenever we are asked to. Uh, we can pilot by uh, bringing a pilot system or we can ideally uh, take an existing RO system and retrofit part of it and demonstrate the uh, high recovery. Uh, very soon, uh, and we'll advertise about it separately, we're going to demonstrate the technology in Alamogordo, New Mexico. This is the uh, desalination facility uh, of the Bureau of Reclamation, and we're going to demonstrate the technology there using different water quality, anything from TDS of uh, about 1,200 ppm to 5,000 ppm. How is the permit quality affected by reversing the flow during operation with flow reversal? Uh, naturally, because of the higher flux and the recovery, there is an increase of typically, I would say, 2 to 4 ppm in TDS. Do you have any energy data to compare flow reversal to closed trigger? Yes, I do have it, and I'll be happy to share with whoever is asking the question. Um, um, yeah, it's very competitive. Just uh, to, to explain uh, the differences very shortly, and again, I have uh, a very detailed comparison that I can share with whoever wants to see it. Uh, the the uh, CCD, the closed circuit row, uh, is completely different uh, our own technology. It's designed differently. It, it looks differently. Uh, the flow reversal is truly a conventional role with an operational modification. Uh, but yes, we are uh, competitive on the equipment. Uh, and both technologies can reach very high recoveries and do not uh, consume a lot of energy. Uh, it's good to have two options in the market. How is it possible to reverse flow on membranes which are typically one directional? Uh, the membranes are basically symmetrical, completely symmetrical. So from the, the, the point of view of the type and the chemistry of the membrane are exactly the same. So there is no problem here. It's just a, a, a concept that needs to be updated, that it's okay to uh, both uh, to work uh, in both directions. And as I mentioned before, sometimes the uh, operators do it to improve the operation of their system. Um, so the membranes are symmetrical. There, is, there shouldn't be any problem there. Uh, by the way, I know this question is being asked because many times the pressure vessel the, on the outside, there is an arrow that shows the direction, but it just for the good order, you can place the membranes in any order there inside. How does flow reversal arrow compare to other high recovery, recovery membrane technologies? Um, so um, this is uh, similar to what I responded uh, uh, before about the uh, um, CCD, the closed uh, circuit RO. Um, it's achieving the same recovery rates, uh, very high, and naturally and consequently, it reduces the concentrate uh, uh, volume. Uh, the difference is that uh, with flow reversal, you can retrofit any existing RO system, which can save a lot of money to the users and definitely footprint. Uh, with uh, closed circuit, you 
need to replace the existing hour system with a different system. And in addition, um, as I said, uh, there, it increases more concerns from the operator point of view because the closed circuit is completely different concept. And somehow I think that it also put uh, more pressure, literally more pressure on the membranes. And from comparison that we conduct, conducted, we also saw that the membranes last longer with the floor reversal compared to the CCD. What are the benefits, if any, to membrane lifespan and or CRP cycles? Um, yeah, there are benefits. Uh, we see that uh, we have a lower frequency of CIPs, so we save on chemicals, and uh, the membrane life uh, is longer because we uh, handle the scale better, we prevent scaling, and we also prevent biofouling. How does the mesh feed spacer not move back and forth slightly on the membrane when flow is reversed? Many manufacturers would be concerned on this movement of spacers on flat sheet. Uh, well, it doesn't uh, happen and we make sure that the shimming is done uh, properly and the membranes are very tight inside. So far, we, we didn't stumble upon this issue. And it's very important that uh, I, I'm trying to make the statements based on the experience that we gathered from the field and not theoretical. How much percentage cost added for the modification? What are the components after that the valves and piping added? So again, every site is different, but generally when we look at the conventional uh, RO uh, that is retrofitted or built as floor reversal, uh, we're talking about uh, additional equipment uh, of uh, 15, 20% in capital. And uh, of course, if there is value there, meaning we can save on purchasing of water, we can save on discharge cost of the water, we can, uh, now we are working on, a, on an application where we are going to save millions to a municipality just by uh, decreasing the concentrate. So the added cost of the equipment, which is relatively minimal, um, is uh, very well um, justified. And again, we need to look at every site. We can, we can be, uh, you know, uh, addressed with a retrofit uh, opportunity and we can make end up making a recommendation to build a new RO system which is floor reversal and not retrofitting it. Um, a rule of thumb for retrofit I think would be that it needs to be at least a 250 gallon per minute uh, RO system to make it cost effective but depend it really depends on every site and the cost of the water. Uh, in the Municipal Reels Retrofit case study slide, you show that Flow Reversal RO had a concentrate flow of 192 versus 489. Does this mean the concentrate is becoming more concentrated? And if so, what is the approximate TDS concentrate of the Flow Reversal RO or the relative concentration increase of the concentrate relative to conventional RO? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Everyone, thank you for all of your questions, of course. Um, yes, the concentrate of the concentrate of the brine, of the reject, is much higher. I can uh, find out what's uh, the specific concentration of this one, but it's direct result of the higher recoveries uh, in the system. Uh, and actually, it's... Uh, not only is it reducing the volume and naturally it's higher concentration, but uh, I had a nice chat with uh, an engineer that is uh, using a chemical method to manage a concentrate, to treat concentrate. And uh, he was very excited about it because uh, obviously he said that the more concentrated the concentrate solution is, the easier it is to treat it uh, chemically. You consume less chemicals in order to uh, precipitated uh, salts. So yes, it's a uh, higher concentration. But remember that since we reverse the flow, uh, we 
basically not concerned about uh, any scaling due to the higher concentration of the concentrate because we reverse the flow so we flush the system all the time and rinse it so uh, when we design a flow reversal uh, ro system we i would say uh, carefully that we ignore warnings about uh, high concentrations of uh, of uh, salts ions in the concentrate because we know that the flow reversal resolves it Next question, how do we reverse the flow? Is it online? I missed it part of the presentation. So first of all, I'll say again, uh, I'll be uh, available. It's not only me, it's our team. We're a big team of knowledgeable uh, people and uh, we will be able to explain it again to everyone. But uh, for your question, we reverse the flow uh, uh, automatically we design it, of course, first, and then it's all programmed. So it's not done manually or there is no concern from the operator point of view on uh, uh, being concerned on when to reverse the flow. And uh, many times we're asked how often we do it. It really depends on the water quality. Uh, we make sure that it happens prior to the induction time. And usually we're talking about uh, 60, 90 minutes. What do you do with the final concentrate? Concentrate. Wow, thanks for the question. This is the $6 million question. Uh, that's, that's exactly the point. We, we are, we're ending up with higher concentration and lower volume of concentrate. So as I mentioned before, we, you can discharge it uh, to a wastewater treatment plant or inject it to a deep wells. Now, depends on the location. Some uh, places, uh, the regulator uh, limit the concentration of the concentrate that you can inject uh, to the ground. Uh, in other places, they don't mind about the concentration, but they care about the total volume that you discharge. And then high concentration and lower volume becomes an advantage. Uh, ZLD, you can treat it with zero liquid discharge technologies like uh, uh, evaporators. If you reduce the concentrate volume by 60, 70, 80%, you need to treat much less uh, volume of concentrate, which makes the ZLD cost effective. There is a whole discussion about it. And in fact, we're going to present at the multi-state salinity conference at the end of February in Vegas. And this is the focus of the discussion. How to handle, uh, how to handle a concentrate, concentrate management. And I heard uh, the term diversified concentrate, concentrate management uh, plan that utilities would like to have different approaches in the same site to concentrate management. So anyway, anything from evaporation to lagoons to deep well injection. The bottom line is that the smaller the volume, the easier it is to handle the concentrate. Is there different, uh, is there? A difference in the cost of maintenance to keep almost or keep almost the same. Uh, we see um, a reduced uh, use of chemicals and reduced CIP frequency, and therefore we um, have uh, lower uh, OPEX for the system. In, as a matter of fact, we just uh, uh, completed a comparison study between conventional RO and flow reversal RO system. And we see in this specific example, and again, it depends on the site, uh, we saw that we can save about 20, in this specific case, $25,000 uh, uh, on uh, um, uh, operational costs per year. But it could be 50000 it could be uh, 100000 And this is just the, the OPEX without the saving on added water or uh, lower concentrated volume. Uh, discharge. Okay, I am told that the next question is the last. What would you, would be the approximately cost to retrofit a 500 gallon per minute system? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, okay, I'm going to just to say a number. It's completely responsible on my side. Um, I don't know. 
let's say uh, let's say anything between 300 to depends on the retrofit it really depends I would say that let's put it this way when we design a retrofit we hope to show an ROI of let's say two to four years to make it uh, um, reasonable. So let's talk about ROI. We're looking at ROI of depending. We even show ROI of uh, 1.5 years. But uh, let's say that uh, to make it a good deal, it should be ROI of, uh, let's say, 1.5 to four years. OK, well, thank you so much, Ronit. Um, You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your attention. And thank you, Ronit. Lots of good questions. We had more time than usual. Um, again, if your question wasn't answered, Ronit will answer by email. And if you have other questions, please contact Ronit. So just for your information, as far as reverse osmosis is concerned, we have tons of training, um, including four levels of certification. So whatever training needs you have in high-tech water treatment, just let us know. So thank you again for attending. As soon as you log off, then you'll receive an email that has three questions um, on a survey. Please reply so that uh, we know what you thought about this webinar. Thanks so much, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.